place in Scripture, but for the main story, we're going to spend in Luke chapter 17. We're going to look at verses 11 to 19. So if you have Bibles, you can open that. We'll also have it on the screen as well. And I'm going to be reading from the New English Translation. Uh, a really interesting story uh, that maybe, maybe some of you haven't uh, heard or remember uh, about some lepers. I'm going to start in verse 11 of chapter 17 of Luke. Now on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was entering a village, ten men with leprosy met him. And they stood at a distance, raised their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went along, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell with his face to the ground at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Now he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus said, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to turn back and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he, is, then he said to the man, Get up and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Let's pray together. God, I ask uh, in these brief moments, as always, that my words would be your words. That whatever it is that you've helped me prepare and want to speak, that they would be spoken. And whatever I prepared you don't want to speak, that you would strike from my memory. And God, whatever it is that I didn't even think up, I pray that you pray, pray that you bring that to mind, God, that you'd speak each of us in a unique way and also to us corporately in a fresh way as well to live out this good news seven days a week. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Well, I, didn't, I think I've mentioned this previously if you've been here a little while, but uh, recently, about I don't know, five or six weeks ago, I don't know how far, time, time blurs for me right now, uh, I, had my, I had my annual review always happens here uh, by, our, by our elders and then uh, by our consistory. And I don't know if some of you feel this way. I, I don't really know. But for me, I, uh, I do not look forward to my review, my annual review. I don't know if you do. Some of you are like, yeah, I can't wait. Um, that's a very rare person indeed. If I, have met, I guess maybe all the people I talk about always complain about reviews. Maybe I'm one of them, I'm not sure. But I, I don't look forward to them. Uh, in fact, for me, early in my journey in ministry, uh, annual reviews were actually extremely traumatic for me. And I'm not kidding when I say this. Uh, because it, it was like um, when we got to that time, like everything that I did wrong came up during my annual review. Like literally like when, if, if, during the year when I do something wrong, it might get mentioned, but most of the time it didn't. But it would come up like this laundry list of things during my annual reviews. Now some of you are like, that's horrible. Well, that was just the systems I was in, these particular churches. Um, there were, there's lots of interesting comments that would, you know, there, and there's all different ways that people did these evaluations. Um, but basically the summary was, here's what you need to do better, and if you don't, we're going to have to do this. So put you on a year probation on your contract or whatever. There's all sorts of things that happen. Um, and I remember some of the comments was like, you know, I'd see comments like, he didn't email me right away when I emailed him. Um, he doesn't seem to care about his office space, which legitimate critique. I was definitely having some problems, you know, with my office space. Um, then I had a comment, he should be in the office more. Uh, he doesn't come across as professional. He preaches too long. I mean, there's all sorts of things that happen. I didn't get any laugh out of that. That's great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Even back then, they were saying I preached too long, right? Um, but there's all, there's all sorts of other comments. I mean, a lot of them, you know, some of them were legitimate. Some of them felt very nitpicky. But in all the ways, as I'm, the way the review and the evaluation was conducted, it was not done in a light that ever felt encouraging to me. Um, by the way, in my annual review this year, I got comments like, he seems like he's too busy for people. Or he appears aloof and preoccupied on Sundays. Now, if I, you know, the, the funny thing about that is, like, those comments are there. And I remember going through these comments with the elders. And I, I remember Eric English, one of our elders, asked a great question. He said, hey, what did you feel like when you saw that appreciation video that got shown a few weeks ago? So back in October, for October, er, for October Appreciation Month, Pastors Appreciation Month, for Pastors Appreciation Month, you guys did a covert operation and said some really nice things about me, and Eric put it in a wonderful video. It was very well done, like 10 minutes long, uh, near the end of October, and I had to stand and watch it 
And uh, I was tearing up. It was very beautiful. It was very meaningful. It was wonderful. But he asked me, how did you feel about that? As we're going through this review. And I was like, that's wonderful. I teared up. It was great. But it, it's almost like there's this wall that I can't feel the full force of that good feeling. But when I think about a comment like, he appears aloof and preoccupied on Sundays, I tend to think about that over and over and over and over and over and over again. I don't know if some of you do that. I do. But it's interesting to me because I recalled at that time when Eric asked me about that video, I remember my therapist telling me, Mike, you need to notice the good things that people say to you too. And it's, it's really fascinating to think about that because it, it seems like it might not have a connection to this text, but I think it does in a lot of ways. Because I think it's really easy to focus on those things that are very negative in light or that give negative energy, right? And I think a lot of times we miss out on all the good things that are around us, which I think this text points to. So let's give some background to this text a little bit because it, it is a bit of a strange text and we're coming right in like the middle-ish end of Luke, which, you know, we haven't even talked about the Gospel of Luke uh, for a while. But Jesus is on the border of Samaria and Galilee, which is about 50 miles north of Jerusalem. I think I have a map of that, hopefully. Slowly, do I have a map? Okay, good. All right, so I've kind of boxed in where Jerusalem is in the bottom, uh, and I put Janae uh, over in the middle there. In the, that's basically, arguably, where the border of Samaria and Galilee are. You can see Samaria right underneath the, the name, the box there, and Galilee up north toward that body of water. So on that border, what's important to know about that, and I, I'm going to have you make a mental note of this for later, Jerusalem and where Jesus is is 50 miles from each other. So that's where Jesus is. He's 50 miles away from Jerusalem, walking toward this area where he passes by uh, these 10 lepers in this region. And it's important to know about all sorts of things what the text is, is doing. One is leprosy. So leprosy, some of you uh, know leprosy as what's called Hansen's disease. So Hansen's disease, they usually like these big boils and like, nah, I'm not going to show pictures of that to gross you out and make you think about that for the rest of the teaching, but it can be really bad, right? That's most people think of leprosy. It looks, it looks hideous and awful. But that is not the way the ancient people would have understood leprosy. Leprosy was a lot more generalized. So it would be like most any skin disease or condition. Um, so it could be Hansen's disease, but it also could be something a little you know, more minor looking than Hansen's disease. All that said, what was important about it was that if you had leprosy, you were considered ritually unclean for the temple. Now, we've talked about ritually unclean or Rufus and Cletus, as someone else understood it at one point in time. <laughs> when I said ritual uncleanness, they thought I said Rufus and Cletus, two random <laughs> Beverly Hillbillies in the ancient times. But ritual uncleanness was, it was a really, and I, I, I don't have time to go through the whole thing about explaining that, other than saying it's a big deal, because if you are ritually unclean, you are not able to connect with other people. You have to stay physically distant from them. You're also not allowed in the temple until you have a way of going through this, this ceremony. Now, here's the problem. People took that to the extreme to a point just to avoid the person altogether and then basically chastise them for being in this condition. And so what would happen is lepers would do exactly what these lepers did to Jesus when they encounter someone who they knew had a reputation for healing. Hey, master, have mercy on us. And they're screaming us out. And they, but they scream it from a distance because they can't, they can't do it close or that person will be richly unclean. They don't want to infect other people, right? That's what's important uh, to know about the context of what's happening. So Jesus is walking. These lepers are screaming at him. And then it's really fascinating what happens here. Um, there's all sorts of interesting things that happen in this. So he says, have mercy on us. And then Jesus responds, not like be healed. He says, go and show yourselves to the priests. Like, why would he say that? That's a strange thing to <laughs> respond. Like, go and see the priest. Like, have them heal you? No. What happens is the priests are the one that confirm your ritual cleanness. The problem is you've got to be healed of your leprosy first before you go see them. 
they're, they're still a problem, though, because they're not healed yet. And yet, that's Jesus' response. But then we find out, right in the next sentence, it says, uh, as they went along, as they kept traveling, in this case, probably traveling toward Jerusalem, because that's where they're going to go to see the priest, it says, and they were cleansed. So Jesus like, tells them to go to the priest, not even healed yet, and then as they're walking along, like, boop, it happens. Pretty cool. I mean, that would be pretty amazing to see, pretty amazing to experience if that kind of thing happens. But what's interesting about this is what happens in the text, which I think is the point of, of the text in this. Because what's interesting is that healing, them being healed really wasn't the point of what Luke is mentioning in the text. And that, man, there's even some jabs here. Because you're in like the border of Samaria and Galilee, which was already indicating that these people probably aren't going to be Jewish. And then there's one man that turns around, which is the focus of the story. And Luke just puts a little note in here. And I love, it, it, in, in our English Bibles, it's a parenthetical, which I love. Like, it's almost like, oh, you know, this is there, but don't pay attention to it too much, right? It's just a parenthetical. I just want to mention it. He says, now he was a Samaritan. Verse 16. Side note, he was a Samaritan. Samaritans are the most hated group of people by the Jews. There's a huge, like, current 500, not now, I'm talking back then, 500-year history of, of violent conflict between the Samaritans and the Jews. And it even goes back longer than that, connecting to the, tri- the, the nation of Israel and when the kingdoms divided on who is the real Jewish people. Samaritans were not fully Jewish. They were mainly half Jewish or less than half Jewish. And the fully Jewish people would lord that against them and say, this disqualifies you from being a Jew and then got into all sorts of hateful hateful, basically racist remarks. It turned in very, very violent. There's a huge history. Samaritans are the last people that Jewish people would think are honorable. You definitely don't want to associate with them. In fact, a lot of times, you don't even go to Samaria. I mean, you don't even want to get near them, lest you be infected by their wicked ways. And the one who turns around happens to be a Samaritan. And he praises God with a loud voice. He's, he's yelling praises to God. He fell, falls on his face to the ground at Jesus' feet. He's like prostrating himself before Jesus and praising God in a loud voice. I mean, this is who, he's a Samaritan. Like, Samaritans don't do that. And we've already heard stories like this before from Jesus, right? There's the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is probably the one more popular that you know, Right? Here's another Samaritan, a leper. He's a leper and a Samaritan. I mean, there's already two big dings that Jesus shouldn't associate with this person, but he does. And so it's interesting already that Luke is very intentional about saying something that the Jewish people then, most of them, would not agree with. That God's grace and mercy and healing is for everyone. even those who are not Jewish. And what's interesting is that in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, or Older Testament, there are countless stories of God healing those who were not Jewish. In fact, one, the, the story that actually parallels this story very much, even in geography, is out of 2 Kings chapter 5 with the, with the prophet Elisha and a man by the name of Naaman who also had leprosy who also was healed, and the, he had to take a journey as well. And we'll talk about that in a little bit with this, with this leper. Like, very, very similar story. And Naaman was not Jewish. And Elisha, the prophet of God, healed him. God's grace is for everyone, even your most disliked and hated person. They can live the flourishing life. And then listen to what Jesus says at the very end of this text. Because I just find this interesting. He says, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. So 
here, I don't know if you've ever thought about this before in this particular text. Because a lot of times, like, there's a lot of texts that, like, Jesus, heal me, you're healed. Go on your way because of your faith. You are healed because of your faith. And that may be true in this sense as well. I'm not saying it isn't. But that's not what's being said here. That's not what Jesus is saying. Because he was already healed. As he's crying out praises to God, and then he goes through another question. Like, there's only one of you out of ten. Where's the other nine? So he goes through this whole little list of things, and then he says, get up, go on your way. Your faith has made you well. He was already healed. So Luke is trying to tell you, like, there's something more than just to being healed. There's a posture here that this person has. By the way, who happens to be a Samaritan? Listen up, Jewish people. That's way beyond just receiving healing. It's a posture of gratitude. It's a much deeper reality than just being healed for this person. So let's go back to my therapist for a moment. One of the other things my therapist told me that was, that was very good is that when people give me gifts, and I don't mean like physical gifts, that, it could mean that too, but especially in the case like, you know, words of affirmation or notes or whatever, that I need to fully receive them. I need to actually believe that they're giving me a gift. That they are, are doing this out of a sense of joy in their own heart to express their gratitude, appreciation, and I need to fully receive that in. And this was like trying to talk about this wall that I put up to, to fully experience that. And he really, I mean, he was really good, but he really got bold with me, and he was, he was the kind of guy that would really kind of be blunt, uh, which I appreciate in a therapist. <laughs> um, and he said, if you, if you don't do that, it's almost like you're trashing their gift. It's almost like you're just pushing their gift back and saying, no, I don't want it. Now, I don't know if that's totally true, but I got the gist. The picture was I wasn't fully receiving the gift. It's almost like I, I rejected the gift by not fully appreciating that or fully receiving it. It doesn't mean do I, do I, do I fall on my, I'm not going to fall on my face before these people and say, thank you, thank you, thank you for giving me a gift or words of affirmation. That's not what he was saying. But the whole idea of, do I take the weight of gifts the same way I take the weight of critique? That's what he was saying. And that's really hard for me. It still is. He said, you probably have a lot of good things that people say to you, but you choose not to see them. It's like we have a radar but, but the radar is not calibrated to tune in to good gifts. I'm only tuned in to the critique. I'm only tuned in to the negative, and I need to recalibrate my radar to detect all of those things, especially the good. And I think that's a lot what it feels like to have a posture of gratitude. It's a, it's a radar tuning. It's calibrating your, yourself to be able to see all the good gifts that God gives because countlessly throughout scripture God is shown as one who always gives good gifts and does it constantly all the time he's doing these things and a lot of times we just refuse to see it or don't calibrate ourselves to see it when it's in front of us And the interesting thing about my review, those two comments I mentioned, literally, no kidding, that was like maybe 5% of the entire review. Like the other 95% was amazing, was like really good things. I mean, no, no kidding, four pages of stuff, all right? And 5% of that, I'm like, Arr! And there's all this other litany of amazing things that I'm just refusing to see or fully receive 
And the great thing is our elders were great at constantly reminding and asking, hey, what do you think about this? How you receive it? They even asked you right after, how are you feeling about these comments? Because you should feel really good about this, they would say, right? Like, that's them helping me get my radar calibrated to see that what's right in front of me. And I still miss it, even after we're done. I don't know about you. I mean, I think a lot of us do that. We have our radars calibrated to sense all the negative things. You know, we're kind of conditioned by our culture to do that. We're conditioned to, to look at all the negative things. Like people say, well, man, if you watch the news today, well, I guess it depends what news you're watching, right? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of news out there. There's a, there's a lot of good news out there. If you can find it, if you're looking for it, or if your algorithm's calibrated to it, right? It's out there. There's a lot of good things that are out there. It's easy to focus on what's horrible around us. Or when really tough things happen, it's like our world shrinks and that's all we can see and think about. Now, I told you to make a mental note. Do you remember how many miles away this leper was from Jerusalem? 50 miles. He had to walk, all of them, 50 miles to Jerusalem to get cleansed. Do you think something can happen in 50 miles of walking from then to there? Even if you're healed. Yeah. Naaman had to walk 25 miles to the River Jordan to receive his healing in 2 Kings. I mean, it was a long walk to get there. A lot of things can happen in those 50 miles. How easy can we forget the gifts that we have received and been given or the good things that are happening all around us? In fact, in this text, it was one out of ten. One out of ten of those lepers turned around to thank Jesus. And Jesus is like, where are the other nine? Now, did those lepers now got their healing taken back? because they weren't showing a posture of gratitude like this other leper? Jesus is like, ah, sorry, buddy. You didn't come and fall, fall before me in gratitude, therefore your healing is done. Leprosy, boom, you're back. I don't see that in the text, and you can't assume that either. Those men were still healed, but this guy recognized that healing wasn't the point. That when there's a posture of gratitude, that's the deeper reality that Jesus wants. Yeah, those, those other nine were still healed. I'm sure they were thankful. I'm sure, I'm sure they're like, wow, this is wonderful. And they don't want to turn around and think about, I, I don't want to go beyond this. I got my healing. I got what I want. I can just move on with my life. One out of ten. Now, I hope you realize this because, I mean, maybe, maybe you sense this if you know me long enough. I, um, I'm not a super optimist. I, I mean, I like to tell people I'm a realistic optimist. <laughs> I'm a realistic optimist. So, I mean, I hope you don't hear these words today thinking like, you're just really optimistic, Mike. I mean, I'm probably more optimistic sounding right now than maybe I have been in the past. But I'm not really a super, super optimist. I just told you I'm one of the nine out of the ten. And then I hear that cliche. It's not a cliche. It's actually from the Bible. The one thing when you talk about gratitude is that the thing I, I hear all the time, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, give thanks in all circumstances. Remember that one? That's right, that's right after pray continually, which is also beautiful. But give thanks in all circumstances. And, it, and people, people mention that to me when, when there's hard things going on. I'm just like, I, I, I want to say really bad things to them, but I don't. Hopefully. Hopefully it's just inside my head. Uh, this feels so cliche. Give thanks in all circumstances. Okay. <laughs> That's just like, yeah, you, 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 you can be thankful because you're not going through anything right now. I don't know if any of you felt that way or not. But I think it feels cliche because we interpret it differently than what it actually says. 
it says, I think this is what we think it says. I think we think, or I'll, I'll say I, because I, I know for me, give thanks for all circumstances. But that's not what it says. It says give thanks in all circumstances. There's a difference. You don't give thanks for evil things happening to you. It's not like, God, thanks for you know, letting this person get murdered. No, you, that's not, you don't do that. You give thanks in all circumstances, meaning life's going to be good and bad. It's going to throw you some curveballs and fastballs and change-ups and all sorts of stuff, good and bad. It's a posture of gratitude in all of those circumstances. Because this God is a giver of good gifts. And what's interesting about this God, which this is one of the inspiring things that actually is one of the reasons I believe in this God, is because he takes things that were intended for evil. He takes things that were intended to harm and can turn them into gifts. You know that? By the way, there's one big major example over here. That, that, that's an example, but this cross, not this particular cross, but the cross, invented by an empire to show, to publicly humiliate and show the empire's domination and to execute revolutionaries against the state. Its intention was to bully and intimidate and show you who's boss. And many people today, when they think about the cross, do not think about it that way. They think about it as a gift. It's about God's forgiveness. It's about God's mercy. It's about God taking on the punishment and the evil that everybody else has inflicted upon him and conquering it through that device. That was meant for evil. This is, this is a story the same all throughout the Bible. It's not just with Jesus. I mean, way back in Genesis, a great example of this is Joseph at the end of Genesis. Don't put the verse up yet. Get that out of there. Sully likes getting ahead of me. So the story of Joseph, if you're not familiar, Joseph is one of many brothers, and he's daddy's favorite, and gives him a special coat. And his brothers, instead of trying to take the coat, instead of saying, you know what, we're going to tease you without end because you're daddy's favorite, instead say, you know what, we're just going to kill you. That's their solution. And some of them, they have a big squabble between themselves. They throw him down a well, trying to kill him. He doesn't die. Then they have a better idea, since he's not dead. You know what? Thought, maybe we'll take him back, we'll give him a hug, we'll forgive him, we'll we'll say, you know, it's okay, we really didn't mean it. No, they decide to sell him into slavery. They see slavers come by. Yeah, we'll sell my brother as a slave. Hopefully he'll die. That's what happened. And Joseph goes to Egypt as a slave. That's where he ends up. So that has a lot of great connections. And then ends up becoming second in command of the entire nation and empire to Pharaoh. Friends, that was not a journey that happened overnight. That was not a journey to just like, you know, he got to Egypt and the next day he's second in command. There's all sorts of things that happen in the midst of that. And then when he's finally second in command and the whole world's going through a famine, and Joseph, in his wisdom, has stored up resources for food in his country to basically feed the world, hence be a blessing to all the nations. And his own brothers and father come back begging for food and he kind of hides his identity for a while. And then he finally reveals who he is. And I mean, imagine that feeling. Oh, by the way, this was the brother that we tried to kill and then sold him into slavery and now he has the decision of life or death over us. What would you do in his shoes? Well, I think the expectation is, yeah, don't help your brothers or get rid of them. And so they're begging for forgiveness. They're begging 
for mercy. And here's what Joseph says. Now slowly can put up the verse. Don't be afraid, Joseph says to him. Am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant to harm me. Listen to this. But God intended it for a good purpose so he could preserve the lives of many people as you can see this day. Look, I'm not going to try to get into the, the wonderful world of what does God know and not know and how does that work. I don't try to get into that. That's not a realm I could walk. But for Joseph, it was giving thanks to God in all circumstances. Look, I know you meant this for evil, but our God is the type of God who can turn those things into gifts. And in fact, it's saving a lot of people. That's what this God does. That's what happens when you adopt a posture of gratitude. It doesn't mean that you should ignore evil things or not cry out for justice for evil things. It doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that you don't feel the weight of those or you don't continue to speak out against those injustices. That's not what I'm saying. It's like, how do I continue to have a posture of gratitude in the midst of everything that's coming at me? Because even in the midst of such horrible atrocities, there are good gifts especially so in the midst of those things that's easy to miss because all we see is the negative. It doesn't mean the negative is not there. It just means we can miss the good gifts that are right in front of us. Giving thanks in all circumstances. I mean, I don't think Joseph was grateful that they tried to kill him <laughs> or sell him into slavery. <laughs> just like the 50-mile walk was for these 10 lepers. Just like moments right now that you might be going through that are difficult. But God has not left you. He has not forgotten you. He still keeps giving good gifts. And I guess my question is, is your radar tuned to see it? Because it happens all around you every day. Here's something that I've continually tried to do to help me cultivate this practice and this posture. And I've said this many times here. It's so easy to forget, so I don't mind reminding you every, like, year. <laughs> but before you go to bed at night, whether you do it in a journal, whether you do it on the notes file on your phone, audio record it, whatever, you should write down two gifts that you received today. That day before you go to bed. Just two. Just write it down. It's, and some of you can type really fast on the phone. I've seen some of you. It's crazy. All right? Just watch the autocorrect, okay? Two gifts that you received today. And then the next morning when you wake up, you should read what you wrote the night before. And then go throughout your day. And at the end of that day, you write down two more gifts that you saw that day. And when you wake up in the morning, you read it. And you do it over again and over and over and over. And here's what I think should happen, or at least it's what's happened to me. You start to calibrate your radar to see the good things that are happening all around you. And when, and it will, if, it hasn't, if it's not happening now, when the hard times come, your radar will be more calibrated to see the good things even in the midst of those hard things because you've been cultivating that practice, that posture of gratitude. And I'm telling you, it is transformative. In fact, I, I, can't, I, can, I can cite scientific studies that talk about when you have this posture, it improves your health, like physically. It's crazy. Like, People can, can like, expand their lifespans by the posture of gratitude. It's crazy, I know. But it's, 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 it's been peer-reviewed. It, it's nutso. And I think it taps into the fundamental pulse, pulse of how God has made us as human beings. We're, we're made to be these types of people because everything that we receive has been a gift from God. Uh, the good gifts have been good gifts to us. When we receive things that are good, it's all from God. 
And we need to continually remind ourselves of these good gifts that are happening all around us. Even when people are trying to cause you harm, even when horrible life events seem to halt your world to a stop, God still sees you. And of course he wants to heal you. He's interested in that. But a posture of gratitude can heal you multiple times over and over and over and over again. Two things that you're grateful for. Two gifts that you received today. That's it. Two. Start tonight. Let's pray. God, I pray that we would tune our radars to your goodness. God, we know that we cannot ignore the horrible things that happen to us. We do not neglect those things. We do not feel the full weight of those things. We know you want us to, God. We, we, you want us to experience all of these emotions. But God, may we remember that you are one that continually gives good gifts, even in the midst of such horrible circumstances. And you are in the business of taking those things which were intended to harm us and turning them into gifts. Only you can do that. And so God, I pray that our raiders would be tuned to how generous you are toward us. We pray this in the name of Jesus and everybody said, Amen. Let's all stand together. Hey, thanks for watching the podcast. If you want to connect with us, click one of the links uh, in the description there to get to our page where there's all sorts of ways that you can find out more information about our church community, uh, what we're doing, and how you can get involved with that. Uh, hope you continue to stay. Make sure you like and subscribe. Share this with your friends if you think it's meaningful. And hope you have a wonderful week. Grace and peace, friends.